we're going to talk about blessing oneself and instead of cursing oneself. But before we do that, James, if you just move to the next slide, I just thought that I'd just share something with you. I um, Last time we talked about blessing our spouse, our spouses, um, and blessing children. And on Tuesday this week, I got a testimony about a pastor in... Uh, in the Congo. That's the man standing up in the picture on the left there. And he'd done a father's blessing over a couple who'd been living together for 24 years and were in a very uh, battleground kind of relationship. And uh, anyway, they decided to get married. So he's blessing them there. And, um, and the picture on the right, there's the wedding ring on the finger. And, um, and they had a daughter who gave birth to a baby in their, in their home and she was not married and that was a very bad relationship as well. And in the next slide, um, you can see that, uh, that, that, that they were blessed too and that's reconciliation. There's mum blessing her daughter and there's the daughter blessing the, um, the father. You know, this is, this is part of my treasure chest, really. These are my treasures. But I like to get them out and look at them because that's what gives my life uh, significance, really. Anyway, let's get on to what we're here for. <coughs> we're, I, I think you all you all know this scripture in Proverbs: "Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit." I've got three different translations here, but the same scripture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. Or in the, or in the Passion Translation, your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life, and the talkative person will reap the consequences. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so, this is true of the words, whether you speak them over other people or over situations or over yourself. Yes, please, James. And so the words we speak contain creative power. In fact, they, they, they really prophesy our future. That is to say, we call forth what we say. Jesus actually said this, by the way. He said, you will get what you say. So cursing oneself then is speaking Satan's agenda over ourselves. Remembering he comes to kill, to, to, to kill, to steal and destroy. He comes to steal our health, to cause division in families, to wreck our dreams and our potential. And, and we do this by agreeing with him. And blessing oneself is the opposite of speaking words of life, and releasing God's agenda over our lives. And since I really, really clicked onto this quite a, well some years ago now, I've been very observant of words that people speak, and myself, of course. And I think that all of us, at one time or another, we curse ourselves. Some of us do it every day. And I've also found that not many of us are actually blessing ourselves, which is why, why we're doing this session tonight. The next one, Jane, thank you. And you know, God does have an agenda for us. You know that, Jeremiah, for I know the plans and thoughts I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So blessing is, is coming into agreement with is speaking and, um, and agreeing with God's plans and purposes, our future really, a hope for the future for our lives. And, and this first one here is a scripture that grabbed me quite a few years ago now, but it's really stuck with me. If this is God talking to Jeremiah, He's having a whinge. And he says, if you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, 
So you can speak on my behalf. I'll use you to speak for me. The implication is that if you continue the way you're talking now, um, you, I, I won't let you do that. And when you start to think about all the things that God says with his mouth, like he prophesies, he blesses, he releases miracles just by speaking. This, this is a very, very big deal. And Jesus said, but I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will have to give an accounting. Now just think about this. This is pretty serious. For every careless or useless, worthless words that we speak. Next one, James. So what the next four slides give examples that I've created, things that I hear things probably that I've said as well, um, of words that are worthless or careless or useless that we, that we can speak over ourselves. This marriage is never going to work. God never speaks to me. I can't lose weight. Nothing works. Everyone in my family is diabetic, so I'm just waiting for it to happen to me. I get the flu every year. Nobody loves me. Looks like I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. Or what about I'm sick and tired of whatever it is? And then we wonder why we're sick and tired. Or I'm ugly, or I'm clumsy, or I'm this or I'm that. God couldn't use someone like me. I prayed for healing, but no one gets healed. I guess it's just not for me. I'll never have enough money. I'll always be poor. No one likes me. I'll never have any friends. I'm afraid of whatever it is. Mum had breast cancer. I'm afraid I'll have it too. You know, I remember, I remember when I was very young in my 20s, so I had to have a medical um, as part of my employment contract. And my doctor looked at my feet aghast and he said, these feet are gonna cause you a lot of problems when you get older. And when I was, you know, when I learned about the power of curses and all that kind of stuff, that was one of the first things I did was to break that curse off my feet. And, uh, and I wanna tell you that I've got beautiful feet. They were, they were fearfully and wonderfully made. And they've done four half marathons when I was in my 50s. So. I'm just saying, I, I broke I broke in that curse, right? Um, chronic complaining, words of despair, and here's one I hear a lot. You know, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm a loser, I'm a loser. I'm always screwing up. I never get it right. And my sister used to say, "Oh, you stupid girl, June. You stupid girl. You've done it again." You know. Or I can't give up smoking or drinking or drugs or porn or whatever it is. And the next one, James. And this one is about our mind. You know, I feel like I'm losing my mind. Uh, sometimes I think I'm going to end up crazy. My brain just doesn't work right. I'm not thinking right today. I never remember anything. This is a this is this is quite a big one. I'm getting so forgetful, I must be getting Alzheimer's. You know, it's when, you, it's when you're standing in the shower and you don't know whether, you, whether, you've, whether, you've, whether you've just got out or whether you, it's, time, it's time to get in, you know. <laughs> well, you know, if this situation doesn't end soon, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. So, you know, that is a... Um, it's just a list of things that I've made up, and there, are, there are, of course, there are hundreds more. But I just want you to consider for a moment before we rush on um, about if any of those kinds of things might apply to you. And if they, and if 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 you if something comes to mind, Holy Spirit, I just ask you even now, Lord, or before we go to the next step, if you would just bring to our consciousness careless words that we say over ourselves there's so many different kinds of things 
it's not just a matter of saying it once, but when you when you when you repeat it, you give it life. Now, some of these things I think are quite easy to correct because it's really just a habit. It's just a habit to say I'm sick and tired, for example. And you can easily change to find an alternative way. But other ones are coming really, I think, from a wounded heart. So, for example, out of an ungrateful heart comes complaining. And out of a wounded heart comes self-rejection, you know, like I'm a loser. Or maybe uh, poor me, self-pity. And out of a discouraged heart comes I can't. And then and, and you could go on and on. But these are the kinds of things. And, and in those cases, where this is quite deep rooted, then we need to counter the lie with biblical truth. So instead of saying, for example, I'm stupid or I'm a loser or I'm dumb or whatever, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Or I have the mind of Christ or I have the sound mind. We need to know scripture, of course, to be able to do this. But the best antidote to a lie is the truth. And um, this was a testimony um, that I received a while back which gives us hope, I think. So this lady is saying, I was at church when you preached about the power of blessing. And it's had a profound effect on my life. And she says, it's a, it's a woman, of course, pardon me. I've always, I've always had a mouth that rapidly outran my brain. And what came out was often not helpful, kind or pleasant, particularly when I was driving. From the day of the service, I began to pray that scripture in Jeremiah we were just talking about. About if we speak what is precious and not what is vile, you shall be as my mouth. And it made the most amazing difference. Within about three days, I noticed that it no longer even occurred to me to use those words. I lived in France for some time, so the idea of benediction and malediction was really interesting to me. I realized that my habit was to bad speak over myself and over others. So, you know, we, we, can, we can overcome this. We can, we can go from kind of overdraft to neutral, if you know what I mean. But we want to go past neutral. We want to go past zero. We want to go now to um, actually speaking God's agenda over our lives, not Satan's agenda over our lives. So here we're talking about speaking and releasing, just, just getting back to the basic thing, what the blessing about is speaking and releasing God's intentions, his plans and purposes and favor, or, or speaking or releasing your potential in Christ, your destiny. And as I've thought about this, I've said, well, you know, God's general intention is that we become more and more like Jesus. I think you'd agree with that both in character and in action, that we, we need to be like Jesus and we need to do like Jesus. And when it comes to doing like Jesus, I think the general mandate is to do the same works as Jesus did. Plus there's gonna be something that is specific for you, some sort of specific calling for you. So let's run through the, um, about blessing yourself. So we've all got a body. We did talk about this in the very first session, but just a quick reminder that instead of complaining about your body or your body part, that we need to give thanks for it. We need to love on it and bless it. We need to speak health and strength over it. So the kind of thing that I would say, for example, and I say this regularly, as I look at myself in the mirror, maybe I say, Richard, I bless you with health and strength of body, soul, and spirit. And if it's a particular body part, then I will address that, that specifically. That I might live out all the days, Lord, that you have 
appointed for me to accomplish all the works that you assigned for me before the before the beginning of time. I don't want to die with any of those works undone in me. I, want, I don't want to die with my music still in me, so to speak, to use a metaphor. And, um, and, you know, it's very interesting, this whole subject of healing, because it's something I've, I think we have to be a student of miracles or a student of healings, you know. And one of the things I think when we don't see healings is that sometimes God requires us to make lifestyle changes. I mean, if you've got a big problem with your knees and you're carrying 10 kilos or 20 kilos more than you should, and that's the reason for it, then God's going to want you to do something about that. And so, and I and I don't think we recognize it enough. We want everything done instantly. But if you do want to make that lifestyle change and ask God for it, he'll help you. And, and one of the most stunning examples of this was a testimony I got from a pastor in Cambridge. And he wrote and he wrote to me and he said, I read your little book. And he said, I thought I'll put it to the test. And he says, I have been blessing myself to be a slimmer man or a thinner man, I think he said. And he said, at the time that I'm writing this, I have lost 37 kilograms. And I thought, well, I'll just check if that's a typo, you know. <laughs> Maybe he meant 3.7 or something like that. But no, but he confirmed. In fact, he said today it is 38 kilograms. Now, what happened was he did not obviously melt off 37 kilograms overnight. But what did happen is that it's like a rewiring, I suppose, in his will and in his mind. God gave him the strength or the, well, I like to think of it as being a rewiring or a, or just something where he, whereby he was able to follow a diet or follow a particular weight loss regime. Because it can be really, really hard doing this, as I'm sure some of you know, like really, really hard. You've got to be in the right space and have the right resolve to do this. And I looked at myself the other day, I, I'd been, preaching in a church and the and the video was taken side on instead of front on. Most of the time the video is is front on. I looked at myself side off and I said to my Richard, you are not a poster boy for uh, for the ninth for the ninth fruit of the Holy Spirit, you know. And uh, which is of course self control. So I, I purposed, you know, that I would lose weight and I and I've gone from hundred and three down to ninety six or seven kilograms. And I know I could go further, but I've just settled there um, at a nice place. And, and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of that because, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. And um, while, we're, while we're still on the, on the body, David and Dale Garrett wrote a little song uh, about blessing the body. This is not the end of my session, by the way, but I just thought we'll bring the song in here now just to break the talk up a bit. my body with restoration my mind my spirit i'm your creation i'm no accident i'm who i'm meant to be because there is no one else the same as me i bless my body with restoration my mind my spirit i'm your creation I'm no accident. no accident, I'm who I'm meant to be, cause there is no one else the same as me. When I think of how you knew me, before I came to be, you knew everything about me, for you created me. So in the name of Jesus, I bless every part of me, receive the Father's blessing, refuse infirmity. I bless my body with restoration, my mind, my spirit, I'm your creation, 
I'm no accident. No accident. I'm who I'm meant to be. Cause there is no one else the same as me. When I think of how he knew me before I came to be, he knew everything about me for you created me. So in the name of Jesus, I bless every part of me. Receive the Father's blessing, refuse the remedy. Yeah. I bless my body with restoration, my mind, my spirit. I'm your creation, and I'm no accident. I'm who I'm meant to be, cause there is no one else the same as me. Cause there is no one else the same as me. Cause there is no one else the same as me. Nice, isn't it? I love that song. So we've just done the body. Now the soul. Our mind, our will, our emotions. You know, I bless my mind to be a holy place. Um, you know, uh, I think we all struggle with thoughts at different times, but I want the Holy Spirit to be very comfortable in my mind and I, and I want to receive words of knowledge, words of wisdom. And so to me, that's really important. I bless my will to come into alignment with Christ. And one of the big things for me is I, I really want to know and feel what Christ feels in different situations. You know, sometimes when I pray in tongues for extended periods, I really, I really feel God's grief for a fallen world, you know, and um, but I need to know that I need to feel his compassion when I when I'm praying for people. So so that's what I, I don't make a big deal out of it. It's very simple. It's pretty much along the lines of what I've just said. But let's just go a little bit. Let's just go a little bit further. You know, I don't I don't know how much time we think about our spirit. Um. But I bless my I bless my my spiritual senses, particularly my spiritual eyes and ears, because I want to see what God wants me to see. I don't want to see what He doesn't want me to see. I don't really want to look too deeply into the demonic realm, but I, I want to. I need to see what He wants me to see, and to hear what He wants me to hear. And it seems to me that if your spirit can be crushed, then it can also increase. It can expand and. And I know that praying in tongues is something that that expands your spirit. It just edifies you on the inside. And and I want to be led by my spirit more and more. I want my spirit to be the dominant part of me, really. That my mind would respond to the spirit, not the other way around. So so I bless myself like that, and um, and I do feel I do feel the difference. But now the next thing I want to talk about, which is a, might seem like a slight digression, but I want to, I like to bless my imagination. See, this is this is the thing. Um, most people imagine bad things. I think I can say that. You know, we can do all kinds of things in our secret. See, imagination. Um, you have to see something. You know, when God created, I'm sure that he imagined or he saw what he was going to create before he created it. And we can use our imagination for good or for bad. And and I think a lot of you may identify with some of these things. But here's some of the things that we do, like replaying past hurts or disappointments or rejections or regrets. Or discouragements or failure. And as we do that, we give place to an indulgent kind of self pity. You know, I remember years ago when I was a very early Christian, I got told off in a prayer group. I must have stepped out of line somewhere. 
And when I went home, I felt pretty, pretty bad. And I, I knelt by my bed, I think, and I was trying to pray. And, and the word self-pity came up into my mind, just floated up there. And although I was very young in the spirit, I commanded it to go in the name of Jesus. And instantly, like a, like a mist, it just lifted off, just like that. So we can't indulge this kind of thing. It can be quite tempting to indulge in self-pity and that kind of thing. It can be, you, you can indulge in it. And um, well, we might imagine what other people are thinking or doing, jumping to conclusions. You see, for example, what if I, was, if I had a rejection mindset? I might walk in the faith point doors and James walks past me without saying a word. And I might think, oh, James is pissed off. Oh, James is vexed with me. <laughs> or, 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 I've seen that James in some way. But James is actually heading off to talk to somebody who's going to catch their attention. You know? But we can have this, we, we can jump to conclusions about what other people are thinking. Or we might like to replay, re, to replay the past, but in our imagination, we change the ending. Um, so that it's more favourable to us. We, we play in our minds what, what we could have said, how we could have put that person back, pushed them back into their bottle, you know, when they, <laughs> this kind of thing. And then you can have images of sickness or fear or depression or lack. And then it can, it can be images of, you know, sexual images. For lots of you know lots of lots of ways and lots of all that kind of stuff so our minds can play with what um next one james with what um c.s lewis would call mud pies but let's do the first one first so st paul counsels us to fix our thoughts on things that are true and honorable and, and lovely and admirable and so on things that are excellent and C.H. C.S. Lewis writes, you know, we're half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum, because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday way of the sea. And, you know, I just think that's so true. And, and this is something I've thought about quite a lot over the years. Um, about the importance of our thoughts, because our words come out of the heart. Our words come out of uh, come out of our, our thoughts. But James, this is the next one, and and I think this is a really really important statement. We become what we behold. We be we 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 become what we look at. Now you just imagine years ago, uh, like a few thousand, probably yes, however many years ago it was, probably 6,000 years by, I don't know how many years ago, that God spoke to Ab Abraham, he was called, and painted a picture, but actually he made him a promise about being the father to a multitude. And poor old Abraham he, and his wife Sarah, they, they were too old to have kids. And so he doubted. Of course he doubted, wouldn't you? Uh, your body's not up, you're not up to that. And God said to him, look, I want you to look at the stars in the sky. Your descendants will be as numerous as those stars. So God gave him a picture. And then not only that, but he also changed his name from Abraham to Abraham. So he did two things. So he he, he um, gave him a picture gave him an image and he gave him a new name and i'm sure that when abraham doubted from time to time he hadn't even had one son let alone thousands of descendants that he'd look again at that's in the sky and i'm convinced that god wants to do the same thing for each of us to give us an image of our potential in christ and a name what do you think about that? So I bless my, my imagination. This is quite a big thing for me. To create on the inside of me who and what, Lord, you want me to become. That your plans for my life will come to pass. 
You showed Abraham the stars in the sky. Lord, help me to see with the eyes of faith who I am to be. Because I, I want to call this forth, you see. Now, what I, um, you know, just leaving this just for a moment, uh, in the past, I've always been a very goal oriented kind of person. And um, I've, I've just been like that. And, and I've regularly examined my life, I suppose. And, and sometimes I get a big sheet of paper and I make a mind map. If I'm struggling with my thoughts, I try and trace the origin of the thoughts. Where did, they, where did that come from? And why, and why was that? And why was that? The, the hand or the negative side. But I try and think big. I really do. And I think, um, yeah, I don't want to be limited with small thinking. Anyway, I just, now let's get practical about this. Let's say that you're a plumber. You're a working man, maybe you've got a family. How on earth does this relate to you? <laughs> you know, I know how it relates to me. I'm just wondering, how does it relate to you? So I asked myself the question, if what should be the difference between a regular unborn again plumber and a spiritual plumber apart from the language which i'm sure would be quite different um like a plumber who does his work is unto the lord what sort of vision or what sort of um what could he imagine in his mind so i have to try and put myself in his place you see so I might decide that when I'm, first of all, I have a clean van. And maybe I make sure my shorts are belted up properly so that when I bend over, you don't see something that you don't want to see. Um, and and I, I go, I go. maybe I, I see a weed on the way up that I pull out, if there is one. Anyway, I'm in the house. I've got to make a di diagnosis. So I ask God for a word of knowledge. So that I do I drill the hole here, Lord, or is there, is there going to be a beam in the way? Or, you know, which side of this beam shall I drill? And what he's doing is work. He's hearing a cough and a sputtering somewhere, and he and he can see that someone is sick in the house. Uh, may may I um, may I pray for that? May I pray for that person? Maybe he notices there's a light bulb out. Now one of his tricks is to always carry a supply of light bulbs in his van. It's one of his ways of, of delivering value. So he replaces it. On the way out, he asked if he could speak a blessing over the household. Do you think that guy would ever have to do any marketing? <laughs> I don't think so. And, um, and you know, he's, and, and anyway, you could talk about his family and his wife and, um, and that kind of thing. Or, or you're a mother of, of, of young children. You know, how are you different from a non-Christian mother? What are you doing that's different? Because, you know, the calling to be a full-time mother at home is just as valuable in the kingdom of God as the calling to be an evangelist or the calling to be a pastor. It's just as valuable in the kingdom. And we will be judged at the end of the day, not by how many miracles done or how many people we've led to the Lord will be judged on how faithful we've been to the calling to our calling and um, anyway that's what I do so can you imagine yourself doing the same works as Jesus I felt I felt I felt Jesus say to me one day Richard I want you to see me doing my miracles and then I want you to swap me out of the picture and put yourself in my place. I want you to, I want you to see yourself doing, doing miracles. See, this is all part of your imagination. This is about part of blessing your imagination. And so I just want to say, you know, don't limit what God can do through you. 
And I was just sharing with James while we were waiting for everyone to arrive. At the moment, just this is just my example, but I've printed six and a half million books at the moment. And I know that at the rate of 125,000 a week, that I'll, I will reach my 10 million goal about the middle of next year. I don't actually have to do anything. It's all word of mouth. And then I think to myself, I, this is going to happen. I, I don't want I don't want uh, I want to be dependent on God. I need something that is impossible. If it's something that I can do, then I, then I, it's not supernatural. I want I want to put myself in a situation something impossible and there's God's in it. So I said we're going to do a hundred million books. And then I asked a really important question. And you might like to ask yourself this question: What one thing? will give me the most leverage to accomplish that goal. What one thing. And I felt it was to employ somebody and to employ a, um, a whiz kid on social media. And so I, I made that decision. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get someone to do what I can't do. And I'm going to put an ad out soon um, to look for that person. I then I asked myself, well, what's the second thing? What would be the second most important thing? And I said, I'm going to pray in tongues continuously for 30 minutes a day. I've got to, because when I pray in tongues, I believe I'm praying God's plan for my life into existence. And then thirdly, I'm going to spend a lot more time waiting on the Lord. It's interesting, isn't it? So, so if we, if we go to the with the final slide, really, Chris, I was taking a long time. I didn't mean to take so long. What's on the final slide there? We got breakout groups now. So here's, here's, here's my. These are the things you might want to just ponder. The first thing is, what negative or limiting things do you say over yourself? That might be the biggest thing for you tonight, or it might not be. Do you have a picture, a dream, or a hope for your future that is inspired by God? Do you know what it is? And look, I know this is quite a hard question. You know, sometimes I think of myself, I'm, I, I'm blessing man, but I've felt that I'm also a miracle man, or I see myself as being a love machine. You know, I have all these ways of, of looking at myself or thinking about myself. How do you think about yourself? Or do you ever think about it? Do you ever think about your thinking, I suppose, is what I'm really saying. And what I used to do, you know, years ago when I was in business, I'd make a, I'd make, I'd make a board, like a storyboard or, a, or a, a mood board. And at the time, I wanted a red S-type V8 supercharged uh, Jaguar. And so I, I went and took a photograph of it in the yard, and I put it on my board. And then I put a whole lot of other things on my board that were spiritual things as well as material things. In fact, I used to ask myself, what do I want to have? What do I want to see? What do I want to do? And what do I want to be? And, and I'd sort of put these... In fact, if I, had a free, if I had a free reign in my house totally, I'd take one of the walls, and on that wall I would put all these photographs of Africa and Pakistan and all these different places I've been with, with tears in people's eyes and, and photos of ministry and things, beautiful things happening. And I put the scriptures up that, that really mean most of my life. And I would look at that every day as I walk past it, you know. Now, my wife isn't going isn't to put up with that, you know. <laughs> but, that's, but, that's, but if I was a bloke living in, living in the house, that's what I would do. And and then and then there's the next question too. Are you using all that God's given you? You know, I had somebody prophesy over me not long ago, and I'm not really big on people prophesying over me. I'm a bit suspicious of them some of the time, I have to say. But what this lady said really resonated with me. Because I've never really understood why God would would anoint me to do the Father's place, because I've never been a really good father. You know, I, I, there's no way that I would have chosen me, really. 
But this lady said to me, God knew that you would run with what he gives you. There's a bit more than that, but that's the main takeout that I got out of it. You know, God's given you, I was so pleased that God gave you something. I've put, I've put, put all my money, all my time, everything into this, into this thing. That, and, um, and you can, I, you know, and maybe I just want to ask you this. Are you, are you limiting what God wants to do through you? Are you thinking too small? Have you fallen into a place of, you know, it'd be very easy for me now to say 10 million books, Dick, hey, you've done, you've done okay, son. Um, you've got a bit of a legacy there. You, you can take it easy now, but I can't do that. There's so many people out there who need to know the love of God. They need to see, you want to understand what I say? So I'm just challenging you a little bit um, about that. And then finally, what one thing could you start doing tomorrow that would make the biggest difference to making the vision a reality? For me, it was employing somebody. For you, it might be going, going to a course or, or, or I don't know, it could be anything. Now, that's a, there's quite a few things there, and I don't expect you to do all of this, but just pick the thing that most speaks to you and think about it. You might even want to write it down, and it's an opportunity just to talk and share among yourselves. Does that sound all right? I don't want to be too, um, too um, directed about it. Whatever speaks to you, think about it, talk about it, maybe make a decision.